So just to give you a, a very brief recap of what we're here to talk about today, um, this discussion highlights San Diego's prevention journey. It's going to include their efforts, their plan to center equity, inclusion, and lived experience in their work. We'll talk about increasing and improving cross-sector partner engagement, improving access and utilization of services, the increased capacity for service delivery, best practices. It's going to be good. This workshop will also include a lot of interactions, lessons learned, fall, fails forward, as it's called, um, and we'll also allocate some time for Q&A throughout the session. But I want to tell you a little bit more about our incredible speaker. We're so excited to be with us today, and that is Amy. <sighs> excuse me while I prepare. We are big fans over here. So Amy has over 20 years of experience in nonprofit leadership, built on a foundation of strategic partnerships and authentic collaboration. In 2017, she joined the YMCA Child Care Resource Service, a social services branch of the YMCA of San Diego County. She currently serves as Director of Strategic Advancement, supporting programs across the agency in providing comprehensive, family-centered services, building out the YMCA Community Connection Hub, modeling and overseeing multiple early child mental health programs. She also serves as a project director for Partners in Prevention, a local collaborative effort to increase child and family well-being and prevent child abuse and neglect. Amy attended Smith College, earning her bachelor's in anthropology, followed by her master's degree in marriage and family therapy from San Diego State University. And with that, we want to say, Amy, thank you so much for being with us today. We're so excited for the conversation. Excellent. Well, thank you for that fancy introduction. I always um, feel like it's a little bit weird to hear, um, but I'm super excited to be here today. Um, I, I'll just share a little bit about um, what's not in my bio, which is sort of what brings me to this work. Um, I personally come from uh, some intergenerational trauma and I've seen the impact of both system involvement and um, difficulty, uh, difficulty um, in terms of family members accessing resources and services and the, and the um, ripple effect of that. And so it really, I'm, I'm grounded both professionally and through education, but also personally um, to really think differently, to think and dream bigger together with partners about what it could and should look like um, specifically here in San Diego. And um, I, I don't know if others on the call share this um, feeling, but it does feel like prevention kind of comes in waves, right? This like investment in prevention, this alignment around prevention, this belief that prevention is worth it and matters. Um, and I'm excited to sort of be able to ride this wave in this particular moment in time. So uh, today I will share on behalf of San Diego, um, uh, a little bit about what we have been doing here locally. I'm excited to have Ariane Porras here, who is on our Partners in Prevention team. And I, I think even some of our partners may be on today. Um, and like Jess said, you know, the, the hope today is that we share a little bit about what we've been doing, but that we really engage in dialogue, um, not just with me, but with one another. There are just so many strengths and opportunities across all communities. And, you know, the, the hope is just to share what we've been doing in the, in the, uh, in the hopes that it sort of sparks some new uh, new ideas or, or new um, uh, learnings from one another uh, through this time together today. So you can see what, what I'm hoping to do is give a little bit of context around where and how we got started, um, sort of what we were able to build on and how we did that intentionally. Uh, I'll share a little bit about really how we, how we got going with this prevention work and what we've learned along the way. And then of course, this, um, this opportunity to deep dive together around the implications uh, and, and again, like those sparks. So I'll start just from this contextual perspective. So <clears throat> many of you may have participated in the prevention summit in 2019. Um, here in San Diego prior to 2019, or, yeah, 2019, sorry. Um, we had been doing lots of stuff here in San Diego. We had a robust family resource center um, sort of network here in San Diego. Um, we're a pretty collaborative community. 
Mm, and I think we had um, really developed some relationships that allowed us to sort of catalyze and expedite some of the opportunities around prevention. What I don't think we had prior to 2019 was an explicit commitment to prevention. I think we were sort of tinkering around the edges. Um, you know, child welfare was talking about protective factors and that they had it as part of their logic model for prevention, but I, I wouldn't say there was um, a lot of action or or um, community engagement around that. In 2019, we started to sort of turn a corner. Uh, at the prevention summit, um, we had some new participants in that leadership team that, that attended that summit. And I think it kind of changed the conversation. Um, instead of just the usual suspects, talking about the same things that they had been doing for many years. I think it was this opportunity to sort of expand the table, to think more about what does the data in San Diego tell us about child abuse and neglect? Where are the gaps? Where are our opportunities? And at that summit, um, the, the group there really decided to focus on the zero to five space. And while we have a first five, it's very active and doing beautiful things, um, that really hadn't been a priority area or a focus area for our child welfare services. So this was sort of a shift in approach that I think um, was, was pretty significant. Um, following that prevention summit, the Children's Bureau issued a request um, for proposals for something called community collaborations to prevent to strengthen and preserve families. So this is five-year federal grant to really support local communities in doing innovative upstream primary prevention work. We sort of threw a Hail Mary and, and said like, let's put our hat in the ring. We think we have come up with some cool ideas. It would be really amazing to have some funding to support it and really build out the infrastructure around this. Um, for some beautiful and amazing reason, uh, we were selected and um, we have been doing that work uh, for the past uh, two years, two and a half years now. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what contributed to sort of our development and vision creation around um, what is now sort of housed and stewarded through Partners in Prevention. So the, the additional context, sort of that historical context, I wanted to kind of give a, a timeline around, but I also want to deep dive into some of the things that were happening in San Diego that, um, that I think really contribute to, to where we landed in terms of priorities and also where we landed in terms of getting started. So the first is that um, our child welfare services was going through a pretty significant transformation starting about three, four years ago. Um, there was some pretty significant um, uh, public information coming out around um, not great things happening to kiddos in foster care. And we had a, a someone on a, one of the, the chair of the board of supervisors really leaned in and said like, what in the heck is going on here? Put together a committee with an 88 point um, plan to really evaluate and, and change how it is our child welfare services works, how they operate, how they staff, how they onboard, how they train, how they hold accountability to the things that they had down on paper. Um, and, and in that process, um, we shifted from a traditional CAPSI to a child and family strengthening advisory board, uh, a little bit broader of perspective um, in terms of participation, but also just this really um, clear commitment to not being a rubber stamping entity, right? But to really, I don't know, air the dirty laundry, I would say. Um, and at that time, we also had brand new leadership in child welfare that had um, just an inherent commitment to prevention. And so I think that that has been really helpful in um, visioning this new and different future for San Diego. The other thing that sort of has been happening, um, probably very similar to many of your communities across California, is thinking about um, First Five, their commitment to serving our littles. Um, here in San Diego, our most, um, our highest percentage of substantiated 
uh, reports happen in the zero to five space. And so we look at data, that's really why we, we landed there. And so partnering with First Five and thinking about how do we utilize and leverage the resources that we have in place there. We have a healthy development network here, which is, is um, sort of a continuum of, of support and partners across the county uh, focused on um, development um, and early intervention. We also know that Lots of stuff is happening in the quality improvement area in terms of preschool and with universal um, kindergarten now. Uh, you know, there's lots of opportunity that influence support and change there, as well as really thinking about early childhood mental health. What does that look like? What does that mean? What do we have in response to concerns that we see in those areas? And how do we support all caregivers, not just families, both biological and resource families, but also childcare providers. Um, you know, in San Diego, so many kids are spending time in childcare. How do we really um, see them as a critical partner in, um, in keeping kids safe and healthy and, and increasing well-being? The other thing that we have here in San Diego is community information exchange. This is a, a project um, housed that are at 211 San Diego. I'm going to deep dive into this later because we've really been able to utilize uh, the evolution of that platform uh, for this work. The next piece that we um, have been really looking to align and integrate is related to AB 2083. Um, all counties should be doing work on this. I'm assuming you all are doing work around that. In terms of integrated leadership, um, thinking about both prevention and complex care um, across child welfare, regional center, probation, um, the county office of ed, and I know I'm missing one, there's a fifth one, and it'll hit me, and I'll say it in a little while, but just really thinking about, we don't need an, an, an integrated leadership team prevention plan, and an FFPSA prevention plan, and a partners in prevention plan, right, how do we really envision together, and align and leverage all these activities, so Families First Prevention Services Act, of course, is a big part of that as we think about what do those community pathways look like? What are those evidence-based practices that will be reimbursed um, by FFPSA? What does that look like in terms of our service array? How does it respond to the diverse communities we have here in San Diego? Is it responsive culturally and uh, linguistically? Is there capacity building needed for our partners to really fulfill this true continuum of care? Um, so we've been doing a lot of work around that more, more recently. And then, of course, um, this idea of a community prevention hub. So this is really where our um, comprehensive prevention plan is sort of headed, thinking about a one-stop shop, both physically and um, sort of conceptually, that there is a place where folks can go to get connected to the things they want and need. Um, I know that sounds like, of course, that's what we need. I don't know about your communities. We don't have that here in San Diego. Um, we have little pockets of it with the few family resource centers that we have, but we don't necessarily have that um, equitably accessible across our huge county. And so really wanting to, um, again, leverage this opportunity. So we've been thinking a lot about how do we, um, how, how, do, how does this play out, right? From, from the idea of mandated reporting and shifting from mandated reporting to community supporting, um, how do we leverage our community information exchange to make um, and track referral outcomes? And how do we engage authentic community voice, right? Like, if we're going to do something different, do we still need, like, I don't know, tables full of just professionals? Um, and if not, if we're really committed to co-designing and sharing power with community members, especially those who have been impacted by systems, you know, what does that look like? How does that change the way we convene? How does that change the way we make decisions? Um, and so we've been really holding that in mind through um, each of these uh, contexts. Okay, um, let me pause just for one second. Any questions or, or need for clarification before I move on? Okay, 
I'm gonna keep cruising then. Um, okay, so I talked about, uh, I'm gonna shift into part, really think, sharing with you about partners and prevention. So I shared with you that in 2019, we received this Children's Bureau Award. Um, the, the proposal was really grounded uh, in a collective impact frame. So thinking about as a steward of this grant, as a backbone to um, really, I don't know, rethinking what prevention means for our community from, from much more of a shared perspective. Um, we, I wouldn't say like only use collective impact, but this is sort of a, a backdrop for that. So, you know, making sure that we're thinking about ourselves as um, being able to support um, establishing a common agenda, um, looking at shared data measurements, looking at mutually reinforcing activities. How can what we're doing be win-win? Um, how can we have those tough conversations with partners around um, duplication and saturation? Um, I, I don't know if that exists in other places, but it certainly does here in San Diego. And then once we know that, what do we do about it? Um, really convening partners, both as this backbone, sort of this organizing entity, but also ensuring that we're facilitating open, continuous, and bi-directional communication with partners. So you hear me saying um, that we, were, we have been a steward of this grant that's very intentional language. Um, we do not feel like we are the owner of the grant. We are really a conduit of the grant in support of improving systems for and with children and families. Okay, so our initial activity, so we get this grant and I don't know, again, have any of you like applied for a grant and you're like, oh, this is so great. And then you get it and you're like, oh my God, now what do we do? That's kind of what happened here in San Diego. Um, so we took a breath, we paused, we reflected, and we thought about who do we need at the table? Who's already doing work in these areas? What do we need to know about the landscape, the history, the relationships? What opportunities do we have? Where are the pitfalls that we need to be cautious of? Um, and we started by just sort of bringing people in socializing what we had proposed in the um, the grant proposal and getting feedback on it, um, you know, and, and really leaning into the places where there was alignment and rethinking the places where there wasn't alignment. Um, we did not like come out the gate like this is what we're doing. We came out the gate like this is what we've been thinking about. What do y'all think? What do we, where do we go from here? Um, from there, we and we did that in sort of two ways. One, we did it in broad um, partner engagement in the beginning, sort of anyone who has a stake in prevention, um, come, come join us. We want your perspective. Um, and then we also simultaneously created what we call um, our advisory committee, so sector level leaders. Um, who we really envisioned as champions for this work, as well as um, folks who could really help us define and provide some guidance. And um, I think also hold us accountable to the things that we said we were gonna do. Um, in the very beginning, uh, with the creation of the advisory council, we worked on a project vision together, a definition of prevention. We identified shared values and principles, roles and responsibilities. So kind of going from this like very theoretical philosophical approach to like, okay, we're aligned around that. What does it mean in terms of what do we do now? So I'm gonna share, share with you um, kind of where, what we came up with. Um, and if folks are interested in anything more on the process, happy to connect offline on that. Um, and then we also um, gathered consensus around a theory of change and then our strategies, activities, priorities, including data measures. Um, those of you who had federal grants, you know that you have to uh, provide implementation plans, evaluation plans. Those are, you know, hundreds of pages each. So we did a lot, the staff did a lot of that work behind the scenes, but we also um, um, continue to, to vet and get feedback and input from our partners along the way. So this is the project vision we came up with. Very simple, right? What we want to do together is cultivate a connected community that nurtures caring, strong, safe, and healthy families. Um, 
each of those words were were carefully identified and um we really came to this uh shared vision from a place of uh consensus we also identified some shared values we wanted to ground this work in some common approaches so the first was around equity um the second was around impact we also were mindful of inclusion partnerships and collaboration and accountability and and what i would add is that as we've done more and more work specifically focused on equity i think we're landing on some new words which include a commitment to justice a commitment to liberation and a commitment to belonging um, and i can certainly share more about um, that journey but i would say we're, we're sort of moving in that direction though it's not been documented yet we also landed on a shared prevention definition. Um, we looked at what the Children's Bureau had, um, sort of what had been, uh, what was being used at the national level. We also looked at the Office of Child Abuse um, uh, OCAP's definition. And while those were similar, they weren't exactly the same. And what we wanted to do was create a shared definition that was really a big tent, that was inclusive, that, um, that allowed for folks in the community, community members, um, social service uh, providers to see themselves in this prevention work. When we did our initial kickoff for Partners in Prevention, we had, you know, multi-service agencies, social service agencies that were doing deep, deep, deep prevention work. And when we said, where do you see yourselves in prevention, folks were saying, like, we don't really do prevention. And I think that had to do with this idea that, like, we hadn't really, like, put a stake in the ground around prevention here in San Diego. Um, well, while there was really, really good work happening, it just wasn't the way we were thinking about it or talking about it. And so for us, this shared definition where everyone um, sort of had a tie to the work was really important to us. So again, we, we uh, you know, wordsmithing can take a bit, right? But we, we worked with our advisory committee. We also worked with our, um, with our partner network, you know, that started as a group of 80 agencies. It's now over 200 agencies. So we continued to sort of refine this over time. But what I'll highlight for you all is that what we found to be important was this idea of a connected community, um, that all children are safe and cherished, um, and that this work isn't just about services, it's really about systems and structures, and that prevention is important, but what's even more important is well-being. Um, and so I think we sort of started to think about this work as that our, our sort of like North Star is to have services service delivery approaches as well as systems that are focused on health and well-being and prevention is like a step along the way there um so what i the point i want to make about this is that this work has been very iterative for us and it continues to be um and so like you'll see um you'll see that as i continue to go through here so this is our shared definition that we landed on. There was also some framing that we talked about, and that was really just continuing to center children and families, their experiences, um, the relationships that they engage in to access resources and supports. Um, are, are they, we could do all the systems level work we want in the world. And also, if it's not getting down to the practice and the program level, we feel like that is not successful. So the way we're really thinking about this children and families at the center, understanding the context of um, social service providers, that they exist in the context of organizations that exist in the context of community. And so we're just sort of always holding this in mind as we think about our work. We also came up with some grounding principles and these are really coming from a perspective of service delivery. So this idea that we're across the board, no matter where a family goes to access services, so self-sufficiency, um, public benefits, um, housing, education system, um, therapy, uh, other social services, parenting classes, 
our hope is that no matter where folks go across our county, they experience services that are respectful, strengths-based, family-centered, trauma-informed, and culturally responsive. Um, I wouldn't say we're there yet, but landing on these as a shared sort of end game, I think have been really helpful in aligning um, our work and prioritizing our activities. Okay, this is our theory of change. So I, I will get into the detail of partners in prevention, but you know, it can, <laughs> this is not easy. This is not a straightforward um, um, social issue we're trying to solve, right? It's complex. It's why we're still struggling with it after, you know, decades and decades. But we wanted a theory of change that was really straightforward. And in our minds, how we think about this is that if we increase protective factors, we will increase child and family well being and we'll decrease the likelihood of maltreatment. And we think that there are just a couple of ways that we can start to move the needle on that in San Diego. One is how we understand family strengths and needs. The second is how we link and connect families to supports in the ways, places, and, um, and what families want. We also think there's some cross-sector, um, cross-agency collaboration that can get improved to better serve families. And then there's sometimes some capacity building that needs to be invested in across our systems. Okay, one other grounding piece to our work is protective factors. I'm sure you're all familiar with these, but we um, really have, um, just centered our work on protective factors um, for probably all the reasons that you all do uh, as well. So I won't go into that because I know y'all are well well versed in this piece. Um, I'm going to share what the project infrastructure looks like um, for for partners in prevention, just as you're thinking about putting your teams together or, or leveraging the existing groups you already have. So we have a local project team, which includes the YMCA, that's um, Irene and, uh, I'm sorry, Ariane and our team. We have Social Policy Institute from San Diego State that serves as a local consultant. We have Harder and Company as an evaluator, and then we're um, uh, partnering pretty deeply with Child Welfare Services. We also, on the right side here, have a federal project team that supports this work. So we have a project officer, we have an evaluation technical assistance advisor, we have implement, implementation technical assistance support, and then there's 12 other communities that are doing similar work. Um, funded by the Children's Bureau. And so we're connecting with those other communities fairly regularly, um, sharing uh, best practices, lessons learned, um, brainstorming challenges together, and just thinking together around how do we, how do we really innovate? Um, how do we do things differently so we don't have the same outcome that we've had for, for so long? And then locally, we have a partner network. So I mentioned before, we have um, over 200 uh, partner agencies as a part of our network now. We meet monthly. We also have a de design team, which is our local project team. And then we leverage work groups. Um, so when we have an opportunity to deep dive into something, um, we use a work group structure. So whether that be um, thinking about capacity building or assessment and referral, we'll sort of convene folks who are interested in that. All right, I am going to, let me pause again. Um, the next section of this, I'm gonna dive into the community information exchange, um, but let me just pause for a second and see if there are any questions. Okay, I'm not seeing my Cal friend, Caltrin friends popping up. There are no nobody. questions in the chat, but if anyone has questions, you're more than welcome to drop them in and we'll answer them as we go. Perfect, thank you. Okie doke. So community information exchange. Um, uh, when I did a similar presentation at the prevention convening uh, this summer, uh, I heard there was lots of interest about what is the community information exchange here in San Diego. So I wanted to dive into this with a little bit more detail. Um, so the community information exchange is essentially an integrated platform for care coordination. Um, it has uh, been in development in San Diego for about 10 years. Um, 
And it is really intended to improve our service delivery through the use of technology. And I say that on purpose because the journey of CIE is that it started as a technology and then uh, sort of evolved to a focus on quality and comprehensive service delivery um, with the technology as a tool to get there. So the Community Information Exchange is housed and sort of run out of our 211 San Diego. Um, I know all of you have 211s in your area. You may have something like a Community Information Exchange either through your 211 or sometimes through health systems um, with lots of uh, changes happening uh, in terms of legislation for hospitals. Uh, this is popping up in, in lots of places. Um, like I said, this is grounded in the development of the CIE it was very much grounded in a person centered model of thinking about social determinants of health, thinking about what are all the pieces that contribute to a person's health and well being? How do we understand what those are? How do we um, how do we respectfully connect folks to those resources? And then how do we ensure that providers are ready and able and to use this technology and have the capacity to respond to the need. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So the components of uh, the Community Information Exchange is that there are a network of partners. We really, um, as a group, uh, have developed shared language so that we're uh, clear on what we're talking about, um, especially as we think about health and social services. Um, Sometimes there's a divide there. I would say here locally in our um, adverse childhood experiences and our ACEs aware work, we realized we were thinking about ACEs in very different ways. And so I think in the CIE work, it's been very similar um, of landing on that shared language, of thinking about how do we implement a bi-directional um, referral process that works both for community members as well as agencies. How do we, again, utilize the, the technology platform? How do we do data integration in a way that does not create um, you know, data entry duplication? Um, and how do we really think about how we're using the data that we're collecting? And then the ultimate goal, again, is just in this community care planning of thinking about lots of times folks have diverse and multiple needs, right? That they're receiving services from multiple agencies. And so how do we sort of coordinate ourselves and reduce that burden um, on families? So one of the ways that has been operationalized in the Community Information Exchange is through a risk and rating scale, uh, which assesses on these 14 domains. You can see them here. They're uh, really grounded in social determinants of health. And along each of these domains, there is an assessment tool that's used both by 211, um, you know, uh, oh shoot, what are they called? Call advisors, I believe. And it can also be used by social service providers that are in the community information exchange. And we're assessing these 14 domains around how um, immediate is the need, right? From this crisis to thriving, um, how connected are the individuals to the resources? Do they know about them? Are there barriers and or supports for those? Transportation, cost, et cetera. Um, and this work continues to, to um, iterate as well. One of the cool things we're looking at now within the system is thinking about um, presumptive eligibility. So if someone is eligible for a concrete support, if there's a you know, family income and family size threshold that applies for multiple programs, can we, sort of just presume eligibility and connect those resources? And what does it look like to share documentation um, so that folks aren't having to submit the same documents for 15 different programs or five different programs, right? How do we just really reduce the burden to accessing these resources? The other piece of the Community Information Exchange is, is utilizing the resource database that is 211. And then also thinking about these bi-directional referrals. So I'll just kind of walk you through this top piece here, which is that an agency makes, so I'll give you an example from the YMCA. We are a, um, a administrator for a childcare subsidy program here in San Diego. 
So our team engages with um, participants in the program. They identify potentially other needs. They can send them into the community information exchange. We once we've identified that need, we um, can make a direct referral. For example, uh, food security comes up as a concern. We're able to utilize the database to find a resource that meets their eligibility criteria, location, language, et cetera. We make that um, referral electronically. The agency has a referral manager that receives that referral, responds to the referral, indicates in the system that they were accepted or declined, and then we can track the outcomes of the referrals. We have a question in the chat. Can Great. you share, um, it, this is an awesome idea for connecting to programs. What assessment tool are you using? Oh, that's the question of the day. So we have um, played around with, so let me, we're using all different tools right now is the long answer. Um, so the, the risk grading scale that 211 and CIE developed um, was based on existing tool, but it was adopted. Um, we've been piloting the protective factors survey too um, through some projects here in San Diego. And we actually had the PFS2 built into the 211 system as sort of like a parallel um, screening tool, intake tool. Um, it's kind of a long story, but I would say there's pros and cons with it. I'm sure many of you experience that as well. Um, and now with FFPSA, there's new conversations happening around what assessment tool for eligibility will we be using that has not been finalized in San Diego yet. Um, and likely that assessment tool, um, will be helpful to determine eligibility, but likely not case planning and concrete support, um, determining priorities for concrete supports for those not in FFPSA. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, does that answer the question? And Jeanette, if you have any more questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Perfect, thank you. Okie doke, I'm gonna keep rolling on this. Um, so again, just kind of mapping what this bi-directional closed loop referral system looks like. Um, we gather client details as a, a CIE partner. We pop it into the system. The system allows for data sharing with other service providers that are serving that family. Um, we're able to make a referral to that make a referral to that other service provider or they make them to us. So someone may have maybe working with a housing um, provider, they identify childcare as a need. So they're sending a referral to us as the, like the other side of the what this could look like. Um, we do eligibility determination, um, us or other uh, agencies. We accept or decline the referral. The referring agency follows up with the family or the individual if the referral is not successful to sort of regroup. Is it still a need? What was the barrier? How do we find another provider to make that referral to? And then again, we're able to um, both provide coordinated care across service providers and track those referral outcomes. One of the things that for me, why I've been a champion of CIE is that, you know, I've been in social services for 25 years and both in direct service, administration and in systems level work. And the thing that always drove me crazy was I, we would engage with the family, we'd identify a need, we'd make a referral. One, then the onus was on the family to follow up on the referral or we did it with them and then it's like lost in the like space, I don't know. And then we would say like, what happened with that? And it's like, we could never get a really concrete understanding of like, did you get connected to the thing you needed? Is that need no longer exist? Um, and I feel like this has been such a game changer for us to be able to say, you identified food security as a need. We made a referral. You, you were enrolled in the program. Has that met your need? Yes or no? If not, what else can we do? If yes, great. Is there anything else we can help you with? So we here at the YMCA have, this has helped us completely change our service delivery system. So I'm not here talking about the why, but I just wanna give you some concrete examples of what it looks like in real life. 
Okie dokie. So I want to take a minute just for us to pause and reflect together. So what questions or curiosities do you have and or what what like ideas is this sparking for you? Um, and how is this the same or different from what's happening in your communities? Can you answer any of those? And as a reminder, participants can also raise their hand in the chat um, if they, you know, oh, it looks like there is a, a question. Can we repeat the question, please, Amy, um, for the prompt? Yes, absolutely. Um, I always do that. I list all the questions. So on here, what questions or curiosities do you have? And also, if you don't have any questions or curiosities, is there anything happening in your own community that this is sparking for you? Either this is a great idea or we've already done that and we've done it this way that you can share with the group. Okay. Is that 17 seconds, Ariane? Not yet. Yeah. All right. I'm going to keep rolling then. Um, and I'm going to share some more concrete details on specifically what we've been doing in San Diego. This was all sort of like the backdrop, right? So I'm going to share with, oh, go ahead, Jess. There is a question. Oh, and a comment. Oh, great. Um, I'll give you the comment. Humboldt is embarking on a CIE, North Coast Care Center. And we see this as a game changer for FFPSA. Yes, absolutely. The other thing I know that's happening in Humboldt is y'all are doing community response guide work with evident change, right? So this idea of shifting from mandated reporting to community supporting, you know, there have been conversations at the state level, we should change policy around mandated reporting. And I'm thinking, fine, but not until we have that community support infrastructure in place. So Humboldt, love to see what you're doing. I think we're on, San Diego and Humboldt are on these interesting parallel tracks right now. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay. And the first of two questions, is there a database shared amongst all providers participants in the prevention circle where family info included uh, that would be needed for eligibility, confidentiality, worry about sharing with CPS? Yeah. Such a good question. I don't know yet. I, I We are still working on that. I think the vision is that the hope is that we can use community information exchange. Um, the challenge, I think, is or, or sort of what we have to work through. So confidentiality is um, sort of built into CIE. So we don't have to worry about that so much because individuals consent in. So that data sharing is fine. Where it gets a little tricky is if, um, is with CWS data itself, right? So if it is a family that is actively engaged with, with CWS, there's some like permission sharing logistics that are still being worked through. For FFPSA, the hope is that we can just use CIE and that we do not need to use this. I'm sorry, I should know this, but the CWS database that's also shifting or something, I don't know. But the, the issue, the concern is that if, if FFPSA is really intended to be around prevention, even if it's secondary tertiary, like it feels a little funky around trust and relationship building to have the data in a CWS database versus a community-based database. So I think we're sort of advocating wherever we can around, around that. Does that answer the question? And of course, if there's any clarifying questions, always make sure to drop them in the chat. Um, yeah. Okay, so next, oh, Dan says yes. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, next question, I actually have two more questions. So the next one is, did your agency develop the database? Do other providers have access to it? So the database was uh, developed and designed by out of 211 San Diego in partnership with others. So CIE actually started as a partnership between ambulatory services, 
hospitals and the homeless um, homeless providers. So that was like the first population that was served because in San Diego, we realized that we were spending, um, I think the first data, um, essentially when they started using CIE in one year, for 25 users, the city saved $3 million. So it was sort of like a, a demonstration project at the start to say like, if we can connect folks to resources instead of just keep them churning in systems, what happens? What happens in terms of outcomes for an individual and what happens for outcomes from a, from a fiscal perspective? Um, so that's what it was built on. It's evolved over time, but the database is, is two on one. Um, they're receiving feedback and information um, constantly and making updates and adjustments to the, uh, the database itself. Thank you. And the last question I have in the chat, how will the CIE interface with CDSS Planned Cares platform? And secondly, second, secondly, how are you framing that in your CPP? Yes, great questions. I'm not exactly sure how it will interface. The hope is that, again, that we can use CIE, um, and if necessary, that we do a backend data integration. Um, but I don't, that's still like in development. I don't, and I, I just, I'm not sure yet, but those are the hopes. That's kind of what we're pushing for. Um, again, like if we can use the resources we already have here, that feels like it's better for individuals and it's better for service providers, right? Like as a service provider, if you're getting electronic referrals through multiple systems, or you have to go to multiple systems to get information on the family, that's not helpful, right? As a case manager. So, I mean, it, I think wherever we can avoid duplication, that's really what we're wanting to do. Thank you. And those are the questions in the chat. Okay, excellent. Okay, I'm gonna keep cruising along then, and I'm gonna dig into what our key priorities are. So this is, I kind of give you the history, and now this is two and a half years in, what are we focused on? So the first, um, so just at a high level, we're working um, really intentionally around cross-sector partner engagement. We're thinking about uh, access and utilization of services. We're thinking about capacity building. We're really deeply engaged in work around, again, like this is equity, inclusion, and lived experience. What I would say this is evolving to is justice, liberation, and belonging. And then early childhood mental health consultation. So we do have one concrete um, programming element to this work, and I'll describe why in a second. So in terms of cross-sector partner engagement, um, there's sort of three pieces to this. One is there was not really convening of partners with a prevention lens here in San Diego. So we've taken on that role. We serve as a conduit of information and by conduit, I mean bi-directional. So we have folks coming and listening to partners. Um, you know, child welfare came and, and shared their community self-assessment plan. Well, the feed, they got that feedback, then they shared what they were thinking of doing, got feedback and input from the partners um, at our meetings. And it goes the other way too, right? Where um, we have partners sharing things that others are, are learning from. We're also very intentionally aligning with other initiatives. So I sort of talked about that already in the beginning. And then there's an evaluation piece where a lot of times, you know, historically from my perspective, we have, um, not always thought about partner engagement as a core part of the work or something we could measure, but we've actually spent quite a bit of time measuring change in um, quality and scope or breadth of partnerships. Um, and we do that through uh, a tool called the collaborative assessment tool, also through something called social network analysis. And we've just been piloting a new tool called ripple effect mapping. So if anyone's interested in those, I'm happy to chat offline. The next piece is around improving access and utilization of services. So you'll see this is around um, supporting with the FFPS, a re readiness assessment in the beginning of FFPSA, contributing to the development of the community pathways assessment, community pathways, thinking about the assessment and referral tools. So exactly what we were just talking about. How do we use CIE? How do we integrate? 
what needs to be separate and why, how do we align with existing FRC work across the community. And then I've talked a lot about this um, idea with the community response guide and fostering a culture of support. So we deeply believe that like changing the, the texture of this, um, honestly, not just changing, but transforming this uh, is probably the most impactful thing that we can do through this work. Um, we know that there's a peripheral piece, which is that we can't just like build this new infrastructure. We also have to think about what are the implementation best practices? How do providers have access to those supports? What does it look like to have um, an infrastructure that supports not just trainings and workshops, but also um, support for integrating those learnings into practice. And so we've been doing a lot of work around um, integrated learning system development and thinking about what that looks like uh, from, sustain from a sustainability perspective. Um, and then, and that includes uh, utilization of community information exchange, so bringing in more of our partners to that. Um, I've talked about centering equity, racial justice, inclusion, inclusion and belonging. And for us, this has really been about working from the inside out, right? So we could have started on programs, we should, we could have started on policies, but we realized that we've all been conditioned in a society that um, is sort of rampant with, with white dominant cultural norms, white supremacist norms, especially in the nonprofit sector, right? That's part of the nonprofit industrial context. And so slowing down to think about what are the ways we may be unintentionally per perpetuating inequity and, um, and not supporting true belonging from a place of authenticity. And so we've been working with an external um, consulting group, uh, Mining for Gold, y'all might be familiar with Corey Best and his team. And um, that work has not just been with our staff team, but other leadership in this prevention space um, in a parallel process with child welfare leadership. Um, and I would say one of the biggest things that we have landed on is that, um, we have no place stewarding this work if we're not co-designing with community, especially those that have been impacted by systems, and if we are not willing to sh share power. And so really thinking about what are the ways that we're holding power that we don't mean to in our practices and our approaches and how do we try that differently? Um, and part of that includes compensating community members, community mm -hmm. consultants to inform the work. So we will be doing some work with the Planning Prosperity Program funded by OCAP moving forward, as well as continuing with partners in prevention. And I would also say we're just a voice for this. Like we don't have the answer, but we know that doing the things we have always done is not enough and it's not acceptable any longer. Um, okay, two other things. Um, first is um, early childhood mental health consultation. I'm not sure if y'all have this resource in your community, but it is a evidence informed um, practice in the zero to five, eight space um, to support capacity building for adults to respond to the developmental needs of kiddos. Lots of times this is provided when kiddos are having behaviors that are um, sort of leading to suspension or expulsion, which we know is part of the preschool to prison pipeline. And um, it is deeply, deeply relational. I would say it's both a prevention activity as well as an intervention. And we built this into our prevention work because we think that it is a critical place where um, families with multiple needs, like we're seeing a symptom pop up and the, the root is sort of um, disconnectedness or um, struggles with protective factors. And so we really sort of have blended those things to those two things together in a direct service support. Um, and the idea is to not just do that support, but to really build a network of providers to meet the need across San Diego County. All right, last piece, and then I'm going to slow down. Um, the last piece is just to document and share our lessons learned, to think about what are the things that um, we want to sustain when this funding ends, how do we transition it into the CPP or FFPSA or the interagency leadership team or any of the things that are happening to just be real 
uh, intentional about that. So it wasn't this sort of like one time infusion that then just sort of falls apart. OK, I'm going to share just some success factors and lessons learned, and then we're going to get into some breakout rooms. So the, the first thing that I, I think when when we reflect as a team together around um, where we've seen success, uh, it's been in being able to convene as a neutral, trusted entity. Um, we've been able to sort of hold community at the center as opposed to our agency needs at the center. And that is um, both a freedom, uh, and it's a liberation, and it's a privilege. And so we hold that really um, with a lot of honor. Um, we also have spent some time thinking about how do we match capacity with expectations and priorities? You know, how many of y'all have like sat in these like collaborative um, meetings before and you come up with this beautiful plan and it's like, okay, that's great. But now I have to go back to like my real full-time job. Um, so just sort of level setting that pacing and the scaffolding of the work. Um, I'm sure y'all would say this about your work as well, that uh, this work is relationship building. It's not like icing on the cake, this work literally moves at the speed of trust, which happens through relationship building at the individual agency sector and system level. So that for us means not just bringing people to our table, but it means participating in other tables as well. Um, we've been really explicit about having conversations about self and shared interests. Like we all say we want prevention and like, if we really do prevention well, we might not have the need for the same service array that we have had for a long, long time. And so how do we think about that? How do we prepare for that? How do we have those concrete, um, those um, really specific candid conversations? And it comes back to relationship building. Um, I talked about um, connectedness and, and sort of cross-pollination in terms of sitting at other tables and connecting initiatives. And then the last thing is just dream big, right? I think it can be easy to like, it's too much. It's like, we can't get there. And I would just say like, one of the privileges of being a steward and, and not being a part of a, a county system is that we can like go real big um, and we don't always land there, but I think it, it like adds to the conversation. Lessons learned, um, we should have done more and deeper community engagement earlier. I mean, full stop, like we should have and, and we have some repair to do because we didn't do that well. Um, I talked about our commitment to equity has been an inside out process, finding the right balance of inclusion and co-creation. So like how, how much do you bake the cake before you bring it to your partners? Um, and, uh, as a backbone entity, I think that's like a very natural sort of thing to struggle with. Um, we have, uh, I talked about this going to where the work is happening, not just our tables. Also this like with dreaming big comes like innovation and true transformation, it takes time. And so if we're looking for quick fixes, if we have tables full of folks who are only results oriented and like maybe not process or relationally oriented, that can create tension. And so being um, mindful of that has been important for us. Um, we've also gotten some pushback, um, right? For folks who are in the trenches doing crisis response and working with some of our most vulnerable families who are saying like, that's great. Like how nice you get to think about upstream prevention. Like I have families right now that have very um, substantial needs, right? So how do we kind of balance that and not just stay in the turn? And then um, lastly, just the how matters as much as the what, if not more than the what. So with that, I'd love to, um, uh, sort of get into some smaller groups to think about um, and reflect on some of these reflection questions. So I'm going to hand it over to Jess. All right. Welcome back, everyone. See some smiles. That's usually a good sign after a breakout session. So um, let's spend just a, a few minutes. I'd love to hear just some highlights of the conversations from your breakout rooms. Yeah, I was going to see if anybody you know, wanted to share, but I'm happy to share. We had a really rich conversation around um, child care providers specifically, since that that is um, the focus in the region that she is 
in charge of. And so we just we're talking about the importance of that continuum of continuum of care model for child care providers um, because there's so much automatically built into that environment that is going to affect you know family well-being. Um, and there's so many details to it that need attention, and especially family child care providers don't have as much infrastructure built in as a center would, right? Um, so we were talking about all these just different aspects of it and and how that can get addressed. Um, so it was it was a great discussion. We ran right up to the clock and it actually interrupted. <laughs> so it was great, great. Did I miss anything, Marina? Or did I capture it? Okay. No, Excellent. you didn't miss anything. You did good. What I was just trying to share and we ran out of time is the areas that I have jurisdiction or that I cover is the Ventura County, the San Luis Obispo, all of greater LA. Um, th those are my areas, which, you know, it's a wide range where I travel from one location to another. So, but yeah, thank you. That's a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Just if you wouldn't mind um, just advancing the slide once and then I'd love to hear from the other group. What did y'all talk about? I don't know if we had a point person, but I, um, I, I just kind of jumped in <laughs> when, and with some help of the, my teammates that had the questions that I didn't capture. But uh, I think we had a great conversation and that, like you were talking about, Amy, this is this is challenging work. It's complicated. Um, but I think where we where I heard from everybody that was in our call is re really being able to build on existing community networks and resources to be able to to do this work, um, at least initially in a way that is is going to allow us to build capacity. Right. Yeah. And, and Diane and, and everybody that was on the call, um, feel free to jump, jump in, Cynthia, Jessica. Um, I can, I just was going to add to what Nicole said. I think um, what was common for me among everybody's comments that sounded different was actually the similarity of just how unique um, some of our county's issues and struggles are. And I'm a probation person and I'm often the only probation person <laughs> in the conversation. So um, so I'm used to being kind of the odd one out, but I think that, you know, we're more alike than we are different in that the, the issue might look different on the surface, but, you know, kind of the, the underlying process and kind of getting through the struggle <laughs> and the overwhelm is the same because someone else offered, you know, they have a lot of services. So it's difficult to figure out which ones they need more of. And then someone is, you know, more of a rural situation and I'm in Contra Costa. So we're in the Bay Area. Um, but one thing I didn't mention is when we were identifying our gaps in services, what we realized, which I'm sure is true for others, is there are a lot of resources already. Um, and people are not utilizing them. So that's one thing that our steering committee has talked about is trying to address what the why behind that, because we can shove things down folks throats sometimes and still they don't feel connected or engaged to even use the resource. And um, another thing that we've asked is kind of we want to ask folks in the community, like, what are we trying to do that you don't actually need? <laughs> <laughs> because mm -hmm. that's an equity issue. Um, you know, I teach a whole thing on it, but like yep. just we're, we're supposed to be giving people what they need to thrive, not just giving everybody, you know, a blanket of the same thing. And a lot of times that's a turnoff for the community is that we're trying to teach them something they already know, and that's not actually what they need. Um, so, but I think I heard a little bit of that from almost everybody who seemingly shared something different, but I think in reality, it's quite similar for all of us. 58 <laughs> different counties and sections. So that yeah. was nice to hear. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kiki. Um, I first want to just thank you from a probation perspective of being a part of this conversation. Um, it is really so important and I appreciate what it might feel like sometimes to be a lone, a lone voice or, or have a lone perspective. So just thank you. It's such a contribution. Um, I didn't, I didn't talk a lot about this, but one of the reasons why one of our um, strategies was around access and utilization is because we had a similar situation, both in having a lot of resources, um, both, both oversaturation and gaps in resources that we needed to reconcile. Um, and there's sort of this thing that kept happening in the zero to five space, which was um, 
folks would identify like, I think this family needs some parenting needs. Let's put them into a three year home visiting program without maybe starting from like, what are your hopes and goals and aspirations? What's feeling hard to you? Like, I actually just need like food security or like TANF like relief for a minute. It actually, my stress has nothing to do with my parenting approach or values. My stressors have to do with like concrete needs in my life, right? So, um, and also maybe if it is parenting, like, do we need to go to a three-year home visiting program? We maybe start with like a parent connection group or a cafe or a, right? So how do we right size? So that's been a part of our, the assessment piece of it is like, how do we right size? So I appreciate that. And, you know, you know, in my words, like I think about, it's not like the what, it's the how, right? Where is the disconnect? And we have all these resources and support services and people don't want to come. Is it stigma? Is it the service delivery? Is it the reputation? Is it, do people walk into places and feel respected, honored, seen? Like, are those the experiences they have it, are having in, in San Diego? The answer is not consistently those things, right? So we have some work to do around capacity building. So thank you so much. Anyone else from that group? I love that's where the conversation went. I think one of the things I heard in our group was not just giving them something they don't need, but honoring what's working for them already. And maybe that's not part of what's included, you know, in the current evidence-based um, practices and how we can use some of those funds to um, help lift those up. Yep. And how, how does that show up in our intake and assessment process? Are we asking, what are your strengths? Where are your, you know, where are your networks and your connections? Like, how are we honoring that? I think we we talk about strengths and needs. Like, we don't ever just talk about needs. We always talk about strengths and needs. And then, you know, how do you operationalize that? And how do you find a tool that captures both of those? I don't know that we're there yet. <laughs> All right, so we're two minutes out. Um, I just, I really want to thank you all so much for joining today. Hopefully, um, this has been helpful, or at least sparked some ideas around the the work that's happening in your own community. Jess, if you want to go to the next slide, um, my our um, uh, my email address is here, as well as our website. Um, there's lots of resources on there. Feel free to reach out to us for anything, if you just wanna talk more, or I think there were some requests for resources, we'll get those out to everyone. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jess to wrap us up.